I am actually delighted that Peter Tatchell is able to be here. Um, with the lights shining in, in, in our eyes, I can't actually see where he is <laughs> anymore. Uh, there's a hand waving. Uh, Peter, if you want to come down, please. Um, because I remember um, way back in 1983, I think it was, one of the, the worst bits of personal vilification in, in any by-election in, in, in any um, political um, system. Um, and Peter has said a lot of things over the years from which a lot of people have learned, and we will learn from him today. So I'd like Peter to come down and receive this medal from, on behalf from the University of Wolverhampton to thank him for the work that he's undertaken today. So now I'd like to introduce Peter Tatchell to come talk to this event. Okay. And my sincere thanks to the Vice Chancellor and to Wolverhampton University for this uh, medal. Uh, it was a big surprise and, and an honour. And um, I accept it uh, not only in my own name, but in the name of everyone who has been part of the great historic battle for LGBT human rights. It hasn't been just down to me. It's been the result of our collective cumulative efforts over many decades that we as an LGBT community are in a much better, fairer place today than we were 10 years ago, let alone 15, 20, 30, and 40 years ago. So my gratitude and appreciation on behalf of everyone who has been part of this long historic freedom struggle. The struggle has gone on for a very long time. And we have seen in recent years, really only the last decade or so, the fruits of that long protracted struggle which began way back in the late 1950s with the formation of the Homosexual Law Reform Society and through the 70s and 80s and 90s with organisations like the Campaign for Homosexual Equality, Stonewall, Outrage and many, many, many others. And lest we not forget, it is often the work of local community groups based in towns and cities around the country that have really made the significant impact. It's all very well to have major organisations, <coughs> nationally known individuals who make the case for LGBT equality, but without the grassroots work in local communities, lobbying local MPs, local councillors, local MEPs, without that work, we would not be where we are today. And where we are today is a, a huge, extraordinary advance on where we were even just over a decade ago. Now, we should never forget that in 1999, or until 1999, Britain had by volume the largest number of homophobic laws of any country on earth. People think that homosexuality was legalized in 1967. No, 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 no. That was a partial, limited decriminalization of male homosexuality. It was only in very specific, constrained circumstances that sex between men and preparatory acts to that sex were, uh, to some extent, decriminalized, not legalized, 
decriminalised. Um, the actual criminalisation of homosexuality in Britain only ended in 2003. It's only nine years since we had a sexuality-neutral criminal code. Uh, until 2003, the law that sent Oscar Wilde to prison in 1895 remained on the statute books. The law against anal sex, first promulgated in 1533 during the reign of King Henry VIII, remained on the statute books until 2003. And both these laws were just two of many laws that criminalised almost every aspect of gay and bisexual male behaviour. They were classified until 2003 under the heading unnatural offences. And it wasn't just the sexual act that was criminalised. It was, for example, the act of two men meeting in a public place with the intention of having a sexual relationship, i.e. exchanging names and phone numbers, you know, chatting each other up. That remained a criminal offence until 2003, punishable by up to two years in prison. Even though there was a partial decriminalisation of male homosexuality in England and Wales, not in Scotland and Northern Ireland until much later, but in England and Wales in 1967, preparatory acts and the aiding and abetting of homosexual acts, particularly homosexual intercourse, remained a crime. So if, for example, I invited two gay male friends to stay at my house, knowing that they were in a sexual relationship and likely to have sex in my spare bedroom, I was aiding and abetting what remained an illegal sexual act until 2003. They were committing an offence by having sex in my spare bedroom while I was present in another part of the house. Because the definition of privacy was interpreted to mean behind closed, locked doors and windows with the curtains drawn, with no other person present in any part of the dwelling. So for whole generations of LGBT students who shared perhaps a house or flat together, if they and their partner had sex in their bedroom, if the bedroom door was closed, even if it was locked, if there were other students in other parts of the house, in other bedrooms or the kitchen or the living room, while they were having sex, everybody in the house was committing a criminal offence punishable by up to two years in prison. Those laws only were finally repealed in 2003. So before Britain goes pointing the finger at other countries, we should remember that the ending of criminalisation in Britain is a relatively recent thing. And of course, the criminalisation of sexual behaviour is just one aspect of the range of anti-gay laws that have gradually, in the last decade or so, been repealed. Uh, the equalisation of the age of consent. The repeal of Section 28. The end to the ban on same-sex couples fostering and adopting children. For the first time in law, protection against discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation and eventually gender identity in the workplace. Later on, illegalisation of other forms of discrimination in housing, advertising, and so on. The advent of civil partnerships to address the lack of legal recognition rights for same-sex couples in 2004-2005. You know, the Gender Recognition Act to allow transgender people to change their gender. All these things are very, very, very recent. They've all happened since 1999. So when you look at the scale of law reform, 
I think we can say with a fair degree of confidence that it is the fastest, most successful law reform campaign, if not in British history, possibly even in world history. When you think of the decades and centuries it took to abolish slavery, to end colonialism, to give women the vote, we have achieved an extraordinary, an absolutely extraordinary pace of change just in the last few decades. The campaign, of course, began some decades ago, in the late 50s, and in terms of the actual legislation, it's all been in the last decade or so. So when we look to the future and we look at the unfinished business, I think we ought to all put our hands together in appreciation for what we have achieved. What LGBT people have achieved, together with the support of our straight allies, has been truly remarkable in terms of social and law reform. We have changed this country in so many positive ways, not just beneficial to the LGBT community, but to the benefit of everyone. Because the process of fighting for LGBT freedom has been about challenging prejudice and intolerance. And in the process, we have made Britain a kinder, gentler, more liberal place for everyone, regardless of sexuality. So I'm now going to talk a bit about what still remains to be done. But it firmly is in my mind that we have achieved a hell of a lot of which we can be truly proud. Um, in terms of what remains to be done, there has been great progress, but there is unfinished business. And I don't think that the positive changes that have happened are any excuse or justification for the further changes that we need to secure in order to end all discrimination in law. Um, as you know, we've had a succession of quite remarkable, positive and very uplifting equality laws, beginning with the outlawing of discrimination based on sexual orientation in the workplace way back in 2003-2004. And then, of course, the protection against discrimination in goods and services in 2007-2008. And then culminating in the Equality Act of 2010. Um, when I stood as a Labour candidate in the Bermondsey by-election in 1983, I proposed the idea of a single comprehensive Anti-Discrimination Act to protect everyone against discrimination and to guarantee equal treatment to all. Based on gender, race, faith or belief, sexuality, gender identity, age, you name it. A comprehensive law that would protect everyone. At the time that was deemed extremely radical. I can remember even as late as 1987, when I proposed these ideas to the Labour Party's policy review, I was told, nice ideas, but the electorate will never accept them. Well, you can imagine the joy I felt that when eventually we had the Equality Act of 2010, which embodied this principle, instead of this uneven patchwork of different equality laws protecting different communities, under the Equality Act, we have a single, uniform, comprehensive equality legislation that gives equal treatment and equal protection to everyone. The only problem is that all these different equality laws, the laws against workplace discrimination, the laws prohibiting discrimination, the provision of goods and services, and even the Equality Act itself, have within them certain qualified exemptions for religious organisations. Not just churches, mosques, synagogues, temples and other places of worship, but also for faith-run schools, nursing homes, hospitals and so on. In every instance, faith groups 
have exemptions from these laws. They're not sweeping exemptions, but where employing an LGBT person or providing a service to an LGBT person would be deemed to conflict with the religious ethos of a particular faith, they have the right to discriminate. Now, to me, that is a fundamentally bad principle because in a democratic society, we should all be equal before the law. There should be no hierarchy, no exemptions, no exclusions. Nobody should have a get-out clause. I should not be allowed to discriminate against a person of faith. Of course, I would not want to. But I should not be allowed by law to discriminate against a person of faith. So why should a person of faith be able to discriminate against me as a gay person. It's not fair. It's not right. Um, you may be familiar that under the Equality Act 2010, the clauses governing protection against harassment have written into them specific, explicit exclusions on the grounds of sexual orientation and gender identity. The protections against harassment do not apply to LGBT people, and that is written in to the Equality Act of 2010. This was approved by the Labour government with the backing of the main LGB rights organisation, Stonewall. The Labour government and Stonewall colluded together to exclude our community from those protections. When I and others challenged them, they said, well, we don't need these protections because we are protected under other legislation. And it's true, the Protection Against Harassment Act of 1997 does give protection. But the point is, the Equality Act of 2010 was supposed to be a harmonising statute, one that brought together all the different protections and different laws into one uniform body. So why exempt us? Why exclude us? Also, if that was the argument, why is protection on the grounds of gender and race, for example, written in to the Equality Act 2010? Why is harassment on those grounds in the Equality Act? Because surely the same argument applies there are other laws that protect people against harassment based on race or gender. So we have this very unsatisfactory situation that LGBT people are not given the protection against harassment in the Equality Act 2010. And it gets worse. The clauses governing discrimination and harassment in faith organisations also has an exclusion based on gender identity and sexual orientation. So when it comes to uh, issues of homophobia in schools, affecting both pupils and staff, the provisions of the Equality Act 2010 do not apply to LGBT people. We are written out. And again, Labour and Stonewall claim, well, there are other legislations to protect us. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. This legislation was intended to be comprehensive, with no exemptions, to give everyone equal treatment. That is not the case when we are written out of these protections. Another issue I think we have to face up to the fact is that transgender people have, for the most part, been behind the curve in terms of rights and freedoms. Most of these changes that were introduced first applied on the grounds of sexual orientation and not on the grounds of gender identity. Thanks to the trans community, they have eventually caught up because they're pressured and lobbied and campaigned. But my argument is, why did they have to wait? Why did transgender people have to wait longer to get these protections? 
Another issue is, of course, the restrictions imposed by the National Blood Service on donations from men who have sex with men. As you know, until recently, about a year or so ago, there was a blanket lifetime ban on any man who'd ever had oral or anal sex with another man. Even just once. Even uh, just in the circumstance where the likelihood of either partner being infected was very remote. So, for example, you know, two 16-year-old boys in the Orkney Islands having oral anal sex, the chances of them having HIV is almost zero. But they were banned along with everybody else. Now, of course, the deferral period has been reduced to 12 months, which is a big improvement. But that 12-month deferral period is not medically or scientifically justified. Not medically or scientifically justified. There is a case for an exclusion period but it could actually be as little as three months. Um, what I've argued is that to protect the blood supply, which is of course the priority, it would be right and proper for men who have sex with men to answer three or four additional questions on the form you have to fill out when you donate blood. Those three or four additional questions could establish more clearly who's at risk and who's not. And then, to be double safe, you could, or the blood service could, um, have additional tests for men who've had sex with men. Not just a test for the antibody, but also a direct test for the virus. And there's another test as well that could be done. Now, of course, these tests are costing money, but the cost is not prohibitive. And if the priority is to get more blood donations, then it strikes me as being reasonable and sensible that the extra marginal cost of doing the extra tests would be outweighed by the advantage of the blood donations gained. So here's an example where even though the blood service has moved in the right direction, it hasn't gone far enough. And again, it has operated on quite presumptive generalizations about gay and bisexual men. There are some gay and bisexual men who, yes, may have had once or twice oral or anal sex, possibly with a condom, possibly with a partner who's known to be HIV negative. But they are banned for 12 months from the date of that last sexual act from donating blood. Meanwhile, a heterosexual businessman who goes to New York and has unprotected sex with lots of women in a city where there's a huge heterosexual HIV pandemic, he is able to give blood. That doesn't make sense. That does not make sense. Right now, of course, we have a huge battle over the right of same-sex couples to marry. The government has brought forward the Marriage Same-Sex Couples Bill, which will ensure marriage equality. Well, sort of. Well, sort of. I mean, it's not true equality because they're bringing in a special bill. They're bringing in a special legislation to ensure the rights of gay couples to marry. It's a same-sex couples bill. It's not the Marriage Act 1949. And again, I've got to ask, why on earth did Stonewall and other organisations go along with this absurd, absurdly ridiculous, absurdly complicated legislation when we've got the 1949 Marriage Act? That's what equality is. Not new, separate legislation. Civil partnerships were a separate law, and we said separate is not equal. Yet now we're going into this legislative push where we've got another separate law. There's nothing wrong with the 1949 Marriage Act. It doesn't stipulate that marriage partners have to be male and female. With a few minor amendments, 
the 1949 Marriage Act is good enough. All you'd have to do is repeal the relevant causes, clauses of the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1973. That's the legislation that bans same-sex marriage. And again, I tear my hair out in despair that so few people realise the ban on gay marriage is only just over three decades old. Prior to that, there was no ban on same-sex marriage in this country. It's a recent phenomenon. It's not a great historic tradition. It's a recent phenomenon. The ban was introduced, actually, firstly under the Nullity of Marriages Act, 1971. It was in response to transgender people who did get married, and because the government wanted to stop this, they introduced this Nullity of Marriage Act to invalidate their marriages and to prevent any other same-sex couples from having a uh, marriage. And then the Nullity of Marriage Act of 1971 was replaced by the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1973. I would be quite content for the 1949 Marriage Act to be the basis of true, genuine equality. And all these issues about consummation or non-consummation, adultery, etc. If you want equality, it's got to be equality on the basis of what heterosexuals have. If that's what your mantra is, equality, we have to put up with the ups and the downs of the Marriage Act as it is and not make special pleadings for certain exemptions. Now, I say all this as someone who is personally not a great fan of marriage. You know, I share the feminist critique. I don't like the long patriarchal history of marriage. You know, just look at the language. Husband. Husband and wife. An alternative meaning for the word husband is to manage and control. And that, of course, is exactly what many men traditionally did to their wives. Uh, in marriage, there's the tradition of the father of the bride giving away his daughter to the future husband, symbolising the passing of women from one man to another. I don't like that. I know marriage has evolved, but it has this history and baggage. It has all these rituals that go with it. Um, for me... I would not want to get married. But as a Democrat who believes in the principle of equality before the law, I will nevertheless defend the right of other people to get married if they wish. Because this issue is not about my personal likes or dislikes or yours. It's about the principle that in a democratic society, we should all be equal before the law. We have civil partnerships. They were an important advance. They did redress many of the inequalities and injustices faced by same-sex couples. Bravo. But as we have said many times, separate is not equal. To have a system of legal segregation where civil marriages are for straight couples only, and where civil partnerships are for queer couples only, that is not equality. And for me, just as important as the battle for the right of same-sex couples to have a civil marriage, also important is the right of opposite-sex couples to have a civil partnership. If we believe in equality, it has to be equality for all. And the sad thing is that the government's marriage equality legislation does not propose to allow straight couples to have a civil partnership. So it's only really half equality, not true and full equality. And again, I'm shocked that Stonewall, which has relied upon the support of straight people to win its many battles, 
and the great work that it does, I'm astonished that Stonewall is not supporting the right of straight couples to have a civil partnership. It says, oh, that's a business, that's a battle for straight people to fight. It never said that when it was requesting the support of heterosexual people in the battle for LGBT equality. Stonewall always asked for and got the support of liberal progressive heterosexuals for its law reform program, its education programs, and so on. So isn't it shocking that Stonewall should now turn around to the straight community and say, we don't care, you're on your own. What kind of selfish mentality is that? I urge you all to lobby Stonewall to stick by the principle of equality. For all of its existence, Stonewall has said that equality is the fundamental overriding principle of its work. Equality before the law. Well, if it believes that, and I wish it still did, it should be supporting the right of straight couples to have a civil partnership if they wish. Some people say, well, do straight people really want a civil partnership? Well, ever since the Civil Partnership Bill was first promulgated in 2003, I was arguing they should have that right. I've been touring around the country speaking, and time and time and time again, I find that a minority, yes a minority, but a sizable minority, of straight couples would prefer to have a civil partnership. Particularly women, influenced by feminism, but also many men. They feel that a civil partnership is more modern, more egalitarian. And if we look in the Netherlands, we can see why. In the Netherlands, they've had civil marriages and civil partnerships open to all couples, straight and LGBT, for a decade. Today in the Netherlands, nearly two-thirds of all civil partnerships are between heterosexual couples. I'm sure that if we had a system where civil partnerships were opened up to everyone here in Britain, we would see a similar take-up by straight couples in Britain. And even if only a handful of heterosexual men and women decided to have a civil partnership, it's their right. This isn't about numbers, this is about the principle of equality before the law. As you know, the Equal Love campaign that I set up with Professor Robert Wintermoot in 2010 is arguing for these twin equalities. The right to opposite-sex civil partnerships and the right to same-sex civil marriage. And we have a case in the European Court of Human Rights right now, which streaks, seeks to strike down the bans on opposite-sex civil partnerships and same-sex civil marriages. That legal case was filed in February 2011, just over two years ago. Up until that time, David Cameron... George Osborne, Theresa May and all the Tory hierarchy <coughs> were still opposed to marriage equality. They were still saying the ban on same-sex marriage should remain. After we filed the application, I wrote to the Tory leadership and I told them, sooner or later you're going to have to go to Strasbourg and justify the ban. What arguments are you going to use? How are you going to justify banning same-sex couples from having a civil marriage? Of course, they knew there were no non-bigoted arguments. There was no rational, ethical reason why same-sex couples shouldn't have a civil marriage. And the consequence was that they decided better to support same-sex marriage and claim the credit rather than be dragged through the European courts and forced to adopt. 
that's how it really, or a substantive aspect of how it came about. Sadly, they haven't yet bitten the bullet on opposite sex civil partnerships. And if they don't, the European <laughs> Court will rule against the British government. Um, if same sex marriage is legalised, our case will be even stronger against the exclusion of opposite sex couples. Another issue we have yet to resolve is the appalling mistreatment of LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. All asylum seekers get a rough deal. The whole asylum system is rigged to fail as many people as possible. The asylum system does not operate on the basis of the individual merits of the case, but on the presumption that every refugee is bogus, that they're economic migrants, that they're telling a tale which has nothing to do with persecution under the Refugee Convention. We know that for LGBT refugees, the difficulties are greater than average. The rate of first refusal is highest, highest among LGBT refugees, much higher than average. And some of those reasons relate to the system, the way in which the government has cut legal aid. You know, nowadays, it's almost impossible for any would-be refugee to prepare a proper asylum application because the funding isn't there. The funding to you know, write the application, to document the person's personal history, to get corroborating evidence from family, friends, to get medical evidence if the person has been tortured, to get police and jail evidence if they've been arrested and imprisoned. All these things cost money. And the budget, the legal aid budget for each asylum case is now cut so low, it's impossible to prepare a proper application. Which some might say is the government's sneaky, subversive, sinister way of cutting asylum numbers. The same goes with the fast track system. You know, many asylum applicants are now put into fast track, which means that they will have about 14 days to prepare their case. Now, for someone who perhaps speaks little, little or no English, who has a complex case to corroborate, it's impossible to get all the evidence in 14 days. Even more so if that person is in an asylum detention centre, which increasingly many refugees are put. They're put in an asylum detention centre. Many of them have fled arrest, imprisonment and torture in other countries like Uganda, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, Iran. They come here to seek refuge and they are put into what is in effect a prison, compounding their suffering, reopening the fears and deprivations that they've already suffered. That's truly, truly shocking. As you may know, until a while back, the asylum system, the favourite trick of the Home Office barristers and some asylum adjudicators, was to argue that an LGBT refugee can go back to their home country and behave with discretion. Discretion. And what did discretion mean? Well, it meant things like change your name, move to a part of the country where no one knows you, and stop having gay sex and relationships then no one will know you're gay and you won't be persecuted. The asylum system never told political, religious or ethnic refugees to behave with discretion. That was only imposed upon LGBT people. Fortunately, it was eventually overturned in the High Court. So now the tactic is, we don't believe you're gay. So... A lesbian who's petite, feminine, who doesn't fit the stereotype, she is questioned. She is doubted. 
she is not believed. She doesn't look like a lesbian, therefore she's not a lesbian. Or at least she has to go the extra mile to prove her lesbianism. Also, if lesbians are being married or have children, that is counted against them, completely ignoring the family, religious and community pressures in many countries that force lesbian women to get married against their will and wishes. Likewise with very macho, masculine gay men. Because they don't fit the stereotype, they're often disbelieved. It's recently a case of a gay Nigerian man. Yeah, even my gay I didn't go off very well when I saw him, but hey, you know, LGBT people come in many shapes and sizes and forms. But because he was so macho and masculine, he was doubted by the Home Office barrister and by the asylum adjudicator. So what's happening now is that many LGBT refugees find that they are now forced to photograph or film themselves having sex in order to prove their homosexuality. What a shocking indignity that someone is forced to film an intimate moment with their partner in order to show and demonstrate their homosexuality. It's a desperate measure because asylum adjudicators in the Home Office have been asked repeatedly you keep on challenging whether LGBT refugees are genuine, whether they really are gay. But you won't provide the criterion of how they're supposed to prove their homosexuality. There's recently been several cases of mostly lesbian women who've had letters from their current or former partners letters from LGBT people in the community where they've settled in Britain, all attesting to the fact that this woman is a lesbian. But still, they've been disbelieved. Still, in some cases, they've been deported back to their home countries. So, what the hell is an LGBT person supposed to do to prove their sexuality? Answer? Photograph and film yourself having sex. Another issue we face is the way in which the law is interpreted. We may have good equality laws, or almost good equality laws, but at the end of the day, if they're not interpreted and enforced properly, what protection do LGBT people have? I'm thinking, for example, of the way in which for years successive Home Secretaries, both Labour and Conservative, allowed Jamaican dance hall murder music singers to come to this country and perform. These are singers who put out records advocating the killing of LGBT people. They weren't just merely homophobic, they were advocating the murder of LGBT people. People like Bridget Banton, Sizzler, Capleton, Bounty Killer, Elephant Man, and so on. Many radio stations for years played their records. Even the BBC. The LGBT rights group Outrage had to fight a several year battle to get the BBC to stop playing songs advocating the murder of LGBT people. Shocking. Almost unbelievable. As I said, successive Home Secretaries gave these singers visas and work permits. Yet, for example, Louis Farrakhan, the leader of the Nation of Islam in the United States, I don't particularly agree with his politics or religion, but as far as I know, he's never advocated the murder of anyone. He's been banned from Britain for over 20 years, while these murder music singers have been allowed to come here and perform. Double standards? I think so. Likewise, you may recall the case of Sheikh Abdullah al Faisal, who advocated the murder of Jews and Hindus. 
He was promptly arrested, put on trial, and sentenced to nine years jail. Soon afterwards, Imam Abdul Muhid advocated exactly the same thing, only he said it was homosexuals who should be killed. He wasn't even taken to court. Not even taken to court. Again, incredible double standards. It shows that the law not only needs to be equal, but needs to be enforced equally as well. And then the final issue I'll just briefly address is the question of homophobic bullying in our schools. An epidemic that has gone on and still goes on. Quite shocking that despite the repeal of Section 28, so many schools are still failing to challenge homophobic and transphobic bullying. This bullying affects mostly LGBT pupils, but sometimes LGBT staff as well. We know that 55% of all young LGBT people say they have experienced bullying in school, ranging from name-calling, teasing, right through to actual physical assault. Um, nearly all LGB pupils report that they had heard um, offensive jibes and language like gay, lezzy, puff, dyke. Um, three in five pupils who'd experienced homophobic bullying said that the teachers who witnessed the bullying had failed to intervene. The teachers who'd witnessed it failed to intervene. Even today, only about half of all our schools have an anti-bullying program that explicitly addresses the needs of LGBT peoples, that specifically challenges homophobic and transphobic bullying. Only about half. We also know that some reports suggest that this bullying is worse in faith schools, and it's faith schools who do the least to tackle it. Again, making the exemptions for faith organisations from the equality laws all the more extraordinary and indefensible. And the consequences of this bullying, of course, means that so many young LGBT people are likely to experience depression, anxiety and self-harm. Uh, we look at various surveys of young LGBT people. I, I omit the T because the research has been about LGBT rather than LGBT. If we look at the experiences of young LGBT people, they are four times more likely than average to experience depression. Three times more likely to experience uh, anxiety disorder. Young gay and bisexual men are seven times more likely than average to have attempted suicide and three times more likely than average to have had suicidal feelings. Um, the largest UK survey of transgender people found that 34% had attempted suicide. 34% had actually attempted suicide. Um, these are really shocking statistics and they show that Although there is progress in our schools, it's uneven and it's not progress enough. It really is inadequate and insufficient that this epidemic of bullying and the consequent negative psychological and emotional effects on young LGBT people, it's really shocking that this is still continuing today. Um, we know that thankfully as a result of the struggle of the black communities, racism is much less today in the school playground than it once was. It hasn't gone away, but it's much less than it used to be. Sadly, with regard to homophobia, we've yet to replicate that success. We are making some progress. The level of homophobic bullying has gone down from 
65% of young LGB people experiencing it a few years ago to 55%. So there has been a 10% drop. So that's progress. That's good. But it's not good enough. To its credit, the government has said the education system should challenge all forms of prejudice to ensure that schools are safe, inclusive environments for all teachers and all pupils. That's great. But then Michael Gove when it sort of semi-contradicted that by saying he was going to allow faith schools to also continue to teach sex and relationship education in accordance with their religious values. And those religious values are often that homosexuality is sinful, immoral, unnatural, abnormal. This sends a terrible negative message to young LGBT kids. No wonder so many of them feel depressed and resort to self-harm. What I propose as a positive is that all schools from the very first year of primary education should be required by law to have mandatory equality and diversity lessons. So every school should have to introduce mandatory equality and diversity education from the first year of primary school. From the first year of primary school, all pupils throughout the rest of their school life should have mandatory equality and diversity lessons to combat prejudice, to promote understanding, to encourage acceptance, not just on LGBT issues, but also on race, gender, disability, faith and belief. The idea is to create an inclusive, compassionate society. Why do I say this? Because, very simply, we all know that young kids are not born bigoted, they become bigoted. And we know from pioneering studies and experiences in some countries and cities that where this early education against prejudice is in place, those kids tend to grow up to be much less bigoted in later life. If schools are about preparing young people for adult life, then of course they have to prepare people for the, young, for the fact that some of them will be LGBT. Or if they're straight, they will know in later life people who are LGBT. It strikes me as just obvious that if you want a caring, compassionate society, you need to take the necessary steps to create that society. Now I would say that having the lessons themselves is not sufficient. The equality and diversity lessons need to be backed up with exams because pupils and often teachers only take things seriously when there's an exam. Make them do the exam. Make those exam results go into their school report make it a mandatory requirement for all job applicants to produce the results of their equality and diversity exams. That's how you get a consciousness that this is an important issue, it's taken seriously, and young people do strive to do well. I don't go with the exam, exam, exam mentality. You know, exams aren't everything. But I think you need exams sometimes to concentrate the mind and to get results. So finally, these are a range of issues, not all the issues, but at least some of the issues, the main issues, that we have still yet to secure and achieve uh, in order to end discrimination and promote understanding and acceptance. We have made huge progress, as I mentioned and outlined earlier. But there is more to be done. And we must ensure that this LGBT History Month and in the years to come, we continue the battle to ensure that LGBT people 
have a place at the table and that we win the acceptance we deserve both in law and in public attitudes and understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'd like to thank you for such a thought-provoking talk. Now, I believe we've got a presentation from the Student LGBT Plus Society of a certificate for your work on equal marriage. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, two awards in one day. Well, wow, that's really... Um, I wanted to go to my head. Uh, that's really, really sweet, and I want to, want to thank you very, very much. Thanks to the students who have done this, and um, yeah, I'm really, really chuffed, and so thank you very much.